evening, everybody. I'm Nancy Worley, Interim General Manager at KPBS. Welcome to tonight's virtual event on the topic of mental health and the Latinx community. Over the last 12, 14 months, really, KPBS has hosted dialogues on critical topics with members of the community. We talked about the census, policing, education, and remote learning, as well as the COVID-19 vaccine. But tonight's topic is a little bit different. The idea to explore this important topic came from you, members of our community. Instead of the news team at KPBS deciding what we thought was important, we conducted a listening tour of the Latinx community earlier this year, and you told us that health, mental health in particular, was an issue not reported enough in the news media, and we agreed. In April, our North County reporter, Tanya Thorne, did a story on the barriers that may prevent some Latinx individuals from seeking mental health help. We decided to follow up on her reporting with a virtual event featuring a panel of experts to answer your questions. So here we are today. I invite you to ask your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to all of them. I also want to acknowledge that there is not consensus in the community around using the term Latinx. Tonight, we are using the term because it is the most inclusive term for men, women, and non-binary people. Beyond today's event, I hope you will reach out to us and share your ideas and topics that you would like to see KPBS cover. You can always do this by sending us an email at news at kpbs.org. Again, that's news at kpbs.org. Send us your ideas. Listening to our community is extremely important to us and we want to continue this conversation. Now I would like to introduce Tanya Thorne who covers North County and who will moderate tonight's event. Tanya, it's all yours. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, bienvenidos a todos. We are gonna have so much fun today. We're gonna to be talking about something very important, mental health. And first and foremost, I want to invite all my Spanish speakers. If you want to listen to this conversation tonight in Spanish, please call 602-580-9255. They're gonna ask you for an access code. That access code is 738-7179. So um, para todos, mi, toda mi gente que habla español, si quieren escuchar esta conversación en español, les pido que por favor marquen al número 602 580-9255 y le van a pedir un código de acceso y ese código es el 738-7179. Así que vamos a empezar. Let's kick it off. So it seems that mental health is a topic that is avoided in many cultures, but specifically in the Latinx culture, there is no talk about mental health, about depression, about possible substance abuse, about domestic violence or therapy in the majority of our Latino households. We just avoid the topic and it's still very taboo among our older generations, our moms, our abuelitas, who often believe it's anything but mental health problems. You know, um, I've heard so many terms, I mean, they're willing to blame it on brujería. Oh, they're just going through a phase. It's the people you're hanging out with. They say therapy is for locos, but the times are changing and the topic is being brought up more and more. The conversation is starting and KPBS wants to help spark that conversation even further. So I recently looked into some of the barriers preventing the Latinx Latino community from seeking mental health help and I'd like to share it with you. But I do have to give this warning, the report that I did includes a description of domestic violence and talk about self-harm that some viewers may find disturbing. So take a look. Estela Chamu's depression began when she left her hometown in Mexico at the age of 17. A family friend told her parents he had a job for Chamu in California, babysitting two American children. But there was no job, and the man who took her from her family wanted her as his woman instead. In that ranch, I endured domestic violence. He would chase me with a rifle and slap me. For 15 years, Chamu endured a forced and abusive relationship. My life has been really sad. I would cry. I couldn't go anywhere. I had no activities. I was barred to the ranch. Until one day, she had enough and left. 
Once on her own, Chamu knew she wasn't okay and sought out help. But the Latinx community faces language barriers, less access to health care, and cultural influences that keep them from getting help with mental health. I needed help with my mental health. The mentality we have as Latinos is I'm not crazy, and it's not that we're crazy. It's that we need support of a doctor, a specialist. One of the biggest barriers is the stigma of being labeled crazy. You have these people telling you, looking you in the face, and telling you, you can just pray this demon away. Andrea Vasquez was diagnosed with major depressive disorder when she was 16. The anger was the bigger part of it, the depression, the panic attacks that I'd been having. And at that moment, I told him, you know, this is a crisis because I don't want to live. Sorry. Vasquez's depression got so bad she began self-harming and checked into a behavioral health center, something her Latinx parents had a hard time accepting. I think it didn't want to accept the fact that I wasn't okay. Um, and that's a big thing in the Latin community, that it's to believe that if you, your child, there's something wrong with your child, it was your fault. The discomfort over mental health within the Latinx community also has to do with the lack of therapists that can understand the culture and the problems they face. It's really hard to find a therapist that connects with those issues. Hey, I, I think I have problems with my family because of my culture. We have to respect their belief system, but also work with them. Um, so what I tried to do is incorporate those beliefs. Ma says there is still progress to be made in mental health services, and thinks the pandemic made the need more urgent. Think about what that's going to do to some people in the long run. We're going to see a definitely increase of people who are you know, experiencing some mild symptoms of OCD, or maybe some paranoia. Um, you know, there's all these things that we haven't even thought about or actually even seen because we're still in the midst of the pandemic. As people rebuild their lives from the aftermath of the pandemic, Ma suggests not sleeping on mental health. It doesn't simply go away. We need to learn and teach people the way to navigate and the way to seek out resources for their specific needs. And how do they do it? And how can they find someone that they connect with? Chamu is building that bridge to resources for her community as part of Poder Popular, a North County advocacy group. For me, it's a new life. Since I left my life with domestic violence and got involved with the groups, it's the most marvelous thing I have found in my life, my work for the community and the help I got. Chamu says these activities have been the best medicine to get her out of depression and help her community along the way. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Welcome to the virtual Zoom world. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties in there, but if you'd like to rewatch the whole piece, please go to kpbs.org after the event and you can find the whole web story and more details about my reporting. Um, but you know, when I did this report, I um, honestly learned so much myself and just at how this report barely scratches at the surface of mental health. And in order to keep the conversation going beyond the story that you just watched, we have three panelists here with us tonight to answer your questions. We ask questions from the community members ahead of this event to also, to also find out what it is that our community wants to know about mental health. And we also encourage you to pop in your questions in the Facebook and YouTube comments, and we'll make sure to get our panelists to answer them for you. So I'd like to introduce our panelists now. First and foremost, we have Lizette Ma. She was featured in the reporting, and she's a marriage and family therapist and director of programs at Operation Hope North County, a shelter for families and women experiencing homelessness. 
She also trains people on the peer model, an early intervention program for young people at risk for severe mental, mental illnesses. And second on our panel is Luis Canseco. He's a domestic violence education and prevention specialist at the Community Resource Center in Encinitas. He works with young boys and men about how to embrace a healthy mascul masculinity. He holds a Master of Arts degree in sociological practice. And lastly, we have Roy Insunsa. I hope I said that right, Roy. He has navigated the mental health system personally and now offers short-term emotional and spiritual help to corporate employees. In part, as the executive director of Square Patch, he has a master's degree in applied ministries, which is pastoral care and counseling. And so the video you just watched earlier focused a lot of them on the barriers that prevent the Latino community from getting mental health help. And I want to dive into that a little bit more. So let's just let's kick it off with one of the questions we received. And this one goes to you, Luis. You work a lot with men. What are some of the barriers unique to Latino men that you have encountered? Uh, uh, so a lot of men in the Latinx community, you know, we, we have this um, this cultural ideology where men cannot seek out uh, help, where they, you know, men are told to suppress their emotions, uh, stay quiet about, you know, problems. If you're dealing with something, deal with it yourself, right? That kind of that kind of thing. Uh, men don't cry. Men don't feel right because if you do cry, you know, you're gonna people are gonna make fun of you. Um, so these ideas exist, and that is what uh, causes a lot of men to suppress their feelings and not not show vulnerability. You know, and so one thing that I focus on when I'm teaching about masculinity, healthy masculinity, is about it's about vulnerability, right? Uh, embracing vulnerability, having the the courage to ask for help uh, when whatever thing is bothering us. Maybe it might be, you know, when I'm talking with young uh, boys, you know, it might be asking for help with their homework, you know. Uh, but that practice of just asking for help and vulnerability, you know, later on in life, when we do encounter bigger problems such as mental health, then we will have that courage to say, hey, you know, there's something wrong with me. I need help, you know. And so that's what I encourage uh, young boys. Thank you. Yeah, así que no tengan miedo. I mean, come on, guys. You know, we need to get, we all need to jump on this boat and be vulnerable and, you know, allow ourselves to kind of break down those barriers and talk about our feelings. And this goes to everybody. So um, thank you so much, Luis. Um, now for our second question, Roy, this one's for you. You got into your line of work after having personal struggles with mental illness. Do you encounter some of those barriers that Luis mentioned? Yes, uh, d d I'm sorry, did I encounter those barriers? Yes. Yeah, you know, in my 20s, I decided to see a therapist at the encouragement of a, of a mentor who was a psychiatrist at our local church at the time. I had a lot of pressure on my chest and uh, felt like I couldn't breathe. So my family doctor, I went to go see my family doctor and he ruled out cardiac issues and then said, he said it was something called anxiety. And I said, what, what's that? And so when he asked me how long I had felt this way, I said, well, for as long as I can remember. Um, and then he asked me if I was sad or depressed and that triggered some feelings in me. Uh, both uh, of those experiences paved the way for me to see a therapist. And I've been receiving therapy off and on since that time. Um, I, I grew up in a machismo home. So I, um, I went the other route. I didn't want to, I, I saw that that didn't work. Uh, machismo didn't work. It was it it was hurting our family, and so I thought, well, I, I gotta I gotta find a different route. Uh, it's not working for me to just hold all of this inside. So, um, so that was my experience. And I think, um, Roy, you're you really are an example of breaking that cycle because I feel like if you hadn't been the one that sought out help, this could have you know, maybe passed on to your um, children and, you know, the cycle just keeps going and going. So I think, you right. know, you're a living example of it. Right, right. Um, perfect, Liz. This next question is for you. Um, this is something present in many different cultures. There can be lots of pressure to conform to very traditional life goals, such as getting and staying married, having children, following certain cultural and religious traditions, how can the pressure from this have a negative impact on mental health? 
<laughs> That's a good question. I actually, I see a lot of young career professionals, uh, females and males, and a lot of them, um, you know, different backgrounds and cultures, Asian Americans, um, Hispanic, um, you name it, Caucasian. And there is this pressure, I wanna say, especially with like Asian and um, Hispanic families, you'll get that pressure of like, get married, have kids, what are you doing? Okay, you have your degree, come on. You have your degree, you went to school, if that's you know within the family goals, that once you have that career or that degree, like your next step is like, okay, hurry up and get married and have kids. And a lot of the times, I think just historically, you know, previous generations, our number one job was to get married and have children. And those ideas have evolved and changed. And some individuals sometimes are not really interested in having kids or having a family. And it just really, it really affects self-esteem. It helps sometimes just the bonding with the family. They feel like they don't understand each other. You know, my mom doesn't understand me. She wants this for me. Um, and sometimes a lot of young people feel that their family doesn't quite get them. So even if they want to start dating someone or they're dating someone and they've been dating them for a while, they don't want to share those milestones that they do with that relationship because then they get that pressure of like, okay, well, you guys been dating for two years. Where's the ring? Or you guys been married for a few years. So like, where's the baby? Um, and it just really affects just the individual on its on their own career and their own goals, just in their relationship status, um, motivation to move forward with their own individual goals, because then we're second guessing what we want, right? So if I'm the individual that, you know, I'm dating, I don't have any children and I'm heading the pressure from family members. It, you know, it really affects you mentally because you're like, okay, what am I doing wrong? Am I doing this wrong? Am I going against the grain? And then there's, there's where we see that people start like keeping things to themselves and we bottle things up. And then next thing you know, we're having an anxiety attack and our chest is hurting. <laughs> no, I think that's true. And I know, um, I feel like for women, we have, you know, a little bit more pressure because, you know, um, children, I mean, it takes, I would, I would say it takes a whole year to have a baby and recover. And even then, you know, I feel like even a year is kind of soon, but I'm curious, um, Loy and uh, Luis and Roy, if you, you know, what you guys have to, if you guys have anything to say about this, like from a male perspective, you know, like, I don't know, pre like, you know, pressures for you guys, you know, and how it, it impacts your mental health or mental health in general with people that you have encountered. I definitely think there's a, a, a pressure for males to be the providers. There's a pressure to uh, hold the family up. Um, you know, uh, Mexican culture tends to, or Latinx culture tends to be uh, very, well, it depends, right? I mean, it's very, it could be very patriarchal. Um, and so, you, you know, you, you assume that like, uh, like for example, if, if uh, Apa is not in the home, then you start getting your uncles and your tias telling you, pues mijo, uh, tu eres el hombre de la casa ahora. <laughs> uh, tía, no, I, I'm only 12 years old. <laughs> You know, um, so there's definitely this, this, uh, uh, like Luis was saying, there is a cultural ideology to say like, well, you're the man, suck it up, go out and work, go out and provide. And, um, and like, that's, that's the narrative. I, 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 I think I gently ask uh, the, the, the men that I provide support with and say, how is that working? Is that, is that working? T tell me how that's working. And then they'll say, well, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's not. So I wonder if there's an alternative way to be a provider, but to also be honest and to say, it's hard to be a husband. It's hard to be a partner. It's hard to be a father. It's hard to be a provider. It's hard not having the education to make the kind of money that I want to make and, and that it's all multifaceted. And when we show up, when we, when we, when we let our life speak, when we bring these things to the Fourier, then it's a lot easier to say, okay, well, what, what are my options and what are my paths and what do I really long for? Uh, so there's definitely those pressures that I think we have to work through and, and, um, and, and, uh, and think through. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we all live in California. It's not getting any cheaper to live here. So definitely we're all feeling all sorts of pressures. So, 
you know, mental health. I mean, it's very, it's something we really need to be talking about. Um, and so this next question is for all of you. I'd like to, for all of you to weigh in. I'll start with you, Liz. Um, what types of mental health challenges have you seen most in your day, day-to-day -day work in the community? Um, I think I shared this with you last time that we met. Uh, there's been, there's been a shift, I want to say. I think since the pandemic, uh, there definitely has been a shift. Um, I think just the, the whole quarantine process, I think just at the beginning, it really changed a lot of people's perspectives and their priorities in, in life. It's like, okay, well, this is like the family unit. We have to do this. And I think a lot of people were working harder than they ever worked. Um, and people were in really circumstances that they had never been before, including ourselves, right? Even us, the professionals, we have never been through a pandemic and now we're being this holding ground for all these people that are having crises. But nobody was, you know, nobody was telling us how to handle this either. So I think, first of all, was the pandemic and just having those relationships. I think the number one thing that we saw a lot was a lot of domestic violence. Um, people had the outlet of going to work or we, they had the outlet of, sending the kids to school and the husband or the wife are at work. So they have those outlets of being home alone. And in the quarantine process, I think one thing that I, I know was the hardest is that kids were being abused more. Like if you called, you know, Child Protective Services line, they were picking up within five minutes. That never happens. They're usually in hold for like four hours. And when they're picking up the phone so fast, you realize no one's calling in because nobody's seeing it. And what I think is like those kids and those couples are fighting and nobody's supporting them because they're they're isolated. Nobody's there to assist them. Nobody's there to help them. There's no teacher watching out. There's no therapist kind of evaluating. And, you know, the Zoom camera can only do so much. Right. Um, so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of um, relationships that maybe didn't realize that they were in a broken relationship and there was affairs that were going on. You know, people are working, I'm working later, coming back late, I have a meeting, and all those were stripped from the ordinary day. And then people, you know, people are like, why aren't you coming? And there was a lot of infidelity issues that, you know, I was getting calls about. Um, parenting, it has been very stressful for parents, I wanna say multitasking, especially working parents. I, my cat off to you working parents that are staying home with the kiddos. I'm a mom myself and I, I am a director of uh, programs on Operation Hope. And one thing that I mentioned that I observed at the shelter is, you know, the parents are actually trying to teach the kids and, you know, the kids need some structure and they're already in a stressful environment, right? Like they're homeless, they're at a shelter and yet they have to work on all these things that they have to figure out. And yet we have to teach on top of it. Um, and another thing has been the financial stress, the insecurity of like, where's the income going to come? What are we going to do? When are they going to cut off the unemployment? The stimulus check, is that going to be enough? I think the list can go on and on and on. But I think one of the things that I, I think that was prevalent was just the dynamic within the family and the households with domestic violence. I think I saw a lot of that, that, you know, people probably because they were together all day, every day, they were probably getting in more and people were re reaching out a little bit more, which I'm glad that I was getting those calls. But it's also unfortunate that it was happening as much as it, it is happening. You know, and I mean, I, the pandemic was a challenge for everybody. I mean, we well, nobody has been through a pandemic. I mean, to the point where we were all literally by ourselves, we couldn't even call the police. You know, even the police wasn't responding to certain calls unless it was a major emergency. They weren't coming like, every, you know, for a while there, we were all at home with who we lived, you know, whether or not we tolerated them. So I can definitely see, you know, how that takes a toll on our mental health, our relationships, um, you know, our mind. And um, Lise, I know you work on domestic violence prevention uh, and, and Liz mentioned an increase in domestic violence. Did you have more people reaching out to you during the pandemic or to your organization? Thank you, Tanya. Yes, there's been an increase in domestic violence uh, and it's very unfortunate, like Liz said, you know, a lot of people 
made those calls to domestic violence hotlines, but a lot of people don't because they live with that person who's causing harm. So it is very hard for those folks to make that call, right? Uh, so there's a lot of people suffering right now uh, in, in, indoors, right? Uh, trying to make a call, but not being avail able to because the person causing harm is right there. Uh, and like Lisa said, um, a lot of young people, yeah. Uh, a lot of domestic violence calls were made and a lot of those calls were younger people. Um, and I'm not a therapist, I don't work on, uh, with people one-to-one, -one, but I do work with a lot of students and also a lot of young people, you know, are experiencing a lot of pain being in home all day and, you know, uh, Zoom calls and Zoom class and all of that. Don't get me wrong, some kids are, are having a good time. <laughs> Waking up in their pajamas and going to school is, 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 you know, it can be really cool for some, but some other kids are experiencing a lot of pain. Um, you know, I have LGBTQ students who, uh, you know, they, they're not supported by their parents. So being at home all day and having that with them all day, it's really painful. Um, yeah. No, I, I think so too. I mean, you know, like I said, we've not, none of us have been through this. So it's definitely a challenge that we're all overcoming together. And I feel like we're all facing it and, you know, coming from very different scenarios. Um, Roy, is there anything you would like to add in terms of this common mental health challenge or a, you know, common mental health challenge that you've seen lately? Yes, I think Lisette, uh, really uh, captured what our chaplains and I have been discussing lately. Uh, are, we've been thinking about what this uh, new normal is going to look like and what challenges people have been facing. So we're, we're kind of calling this a, we know that the pandemic isn't over, but we're leaning more towards what we're referring to as a post-pandemic season. And what are the challenges that people were facing and are continue, continuing to face? And so, we're going to be focusing on uh, on a call back to uh, deepening relationships uh, with yourself, with your spouse, with your kids, with your partner in the workplace, uh, because we saw such an uptick in panic attack anxieties. Uh, people were having panic attacks at work. People were overtaxed uh, stress-wise. So you had the difficulty of managing your home life which was an uproar. Uh, we have teenagers and we think that was difficult, but if you had grade level kids school and you don't have the, you have to go to work or, or you don't have the technology or the bandwidth to figure that out, that is really going to set back a lot of people in the Latinx community. And so those are things that I'm trying to be very mindful of in the workplace and figure out how we can come alongside them, resource them, encourage, equip, help them grieve the losses that they had during this time, help them name what they're actually experiencing. I had employees whose heart rates were elevated. They were sweaty at work because they had to cope with challenges at home. And then the increase of work in the workplace. And then all of the new uh, mask guidelines, testing, COVID testing, uh, uh, people getting sick and then not being able to go to work. And so people were getting extra work and having to, I mean, the biggest word was adapting, right? And being resilient, but you're still having to deal with all of these emotions and what do you do with them? And so what we're going to do is shift our focus to what post pandemic care is going to look like. And we saw an increase of marital strain, divorce, infidelity, uh, financial pressure, um, and, and then a broken a brokenness in relationships. Uh, all of your social networks uh, um, came to a halt to, to, to some extent. And now you're having to re-engage in, in your friendships. And so we think that the pressure cooker of the pandemic revealed the good stuff in us, how we're resilient, how we can adapt, how we can overcome, but it also exposed us a little bit. It exposed where some of the, crack, uh, the cracks were. And I think, again, being vulnerable and honest about that is the best place for healing and hope. 
You know, and I think you bring up a great point, like the resources, you know, I mean, when I grew up, you know, in my Latino household, I, a lot of the times was a translator for my mom. Like, I can't imagine my mom having to teach me how to Zoom or even use a, like a laptop or the technology that these kids, you know, were having to deal with. So this also really highlighted the resources that a lot of Latino households were lacking. Um, you know, but I'd like to move on to the next question. We got an, uh, an emailed question from immigration attorney Elizabeth Lopez. She wrote, many cultures don't see depression or post-traumatic stress disorder as a psychological condition, but rather just that person is being lazy or weak. Not only does that not ask for help, but they don't even consider it something that should be asked for help to cure. Um, Liz, I want to know, like, at what point do you think we should be seeking help? And are there certain signs we should be looking out for? It's, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think post-traumatic stress disorder, I mean, I used to work with the VA for five years, right? So we saw it a lot. Um, and I also work with severe mental health. And a lot of the times, you know, you're treating the individual, but they also treating the family members who have had some post-traumatic stress because of the incidents that they have witnessed with that individual that has post-traumatic stress. And I think a lot of the times when somebody witnesses a post-traumatic stress is, you know, witnessing a life-threatening event that somebody's life was at risk and there's this kind of like a shock, right? And sometimes you can have reoccurring dreams, memories, flashbacks, um, depression, some anxiety that, you know, if it's remembering the place or the area. Um, and a lot of the times it's reoccurring for about six months after the event, right? Um, very vivid. A lot of the times people think I can't shake it off. Um, I'm just thinking a lot about because I still kind of dealing with it. A lot of the times that really handicaps people. And I think that what the really handicapping component of it is that because they think that they're dealing with it by ignoring it, but it's not a big deal. And I think with our Latinx community, I want to mention something like the adults, the males in our families. Um, like Roy was saying, you know, like Ponte Trabajar, get to work, you're the man in the family. That was happening a lot right now during the pandemic, right? A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people got their hours cut. A lot of people were living in a check, you know, paycheck by paycheck by check, paycheck. And I can guarantee you that those parents, those macho guys that were kind of leading the home and feeding the family, they're tired, they're stressed out of their mind they're probably having some post-traumatic stress disorder just during the pandemic and losing their job and fearing that they're going to lose their home and they're not going to be able to afford. And how do they address it? And first of all, it's recognizing to the individual. One thing is seeking help, but before you seek help, the individual has to recognize like I'm tired or something is wrong. Pushing it down and ignoring it, I'm telling you right now, it's going to make it worse down the line. Maybe you are a very strong male, very strong female, very strong individual. Yes, Latinos, Latinx people, somos trabajadores and we'll push through. I get it. But it's only going to last so long. It's going to catch up. So when you feel that you're pressing it down, first is acknowledging it for yourself and then maybe talking to a medical professional and addressing some of those traumas. And Latinos tend to go to the doctor until it's like they're really sick. You know, they end up maybe even going to the emergency room. They don't they don't think, oh, something's hurting. Maybe I should go like they wait till the last minute. Porque somos tercos. You know, we we don't want we don't have the time. We got to work. We don't have time to go to the doctor or, you know, take time off. Like I get it. I see it in my family. I see it in our, in our culture. And it's, you know, and that kind of brings me to the next question, like, what is the difference between a like a doctor's visit and getting a referral for a therapist? Like, you know, a lot of our, maybe something is hurting, maybe something is wrong and they go to the doctors when, you know, maybe they should be looking for a therapist or, you know, how, how does one get that referral? I don't know um, who would like to jump on and answer this question. Liz, I think you're muted if you were gonna put some input. <laughs> I think like Roy mentioned earlier, uh, you know, he was having some chest pain, right? And typically with the lead next to me, that's how we're get the, gonna get him in because they wait, they bottled it so much that now we're having physical reactions. Like we're getting chest pain, we're getting headaches, we're getting vertigo, like our blood pressure is high because we were like already at the cap. So now we're like, oh, something's wrong physically. I'm gonna go to the doctor. Once it gets ruled out, the doctor's gonna say, 
you know, you're stressed out, you're depressed, you're anxious, you need to go see a therapist. When other, some other cultures like Caucasian Americans are like, you know what, you're a little depressed, maybe we need to go see the psychiatrist, or maybe you're a little anxious, let's go talk to the therapist. Within our community, I think that we wait, and that's the problem. I think this is, this is a call for action. Let's not wait until our chest is hurting. Okay, we know that something's off. Let's go talk to someone. In the referral process, if we have, if we have someone that we know, right? We might not know everything about it, but we, if we know that they're going through a change, even just the pandemic, if we know that, you know, directors or managers or just us in general, we have been working harder than, you know, we have ever done before. So our stress level was higher. Are we deep? decompressing are we releasing some of that stress if we know we're not and we're just kind of pushing it down then it's healthy for us to talk to someone about it and how can we cope with it you can go to your pastor if you feel comfortable you can go to a mentor you can call uh you know some of the hotlines to just talk to someone and just get some guidelines because i think sometimes within our community we don't know what it is we just know that something's off and I just want to say, if you know, we know when something's wrong with us, right? So if you know that something's off, let's reach out to help and let's not go to the emergency room when we're 20 something years old and think that we're having a heart attack. And, you know, I think, you know, the hotlines, I feel like people are, you know, our community and I think the community in general is a little hesitant about calling the hotlines. I mean, it's a 1-800 number, you know, how are they going to help? But I feel like they're, you know, they're very helpful and you don't know, you know, what resources they're going to offer you. So, I mean, through my own reporting, I found so many websites and hotlines. So, I mean, I definitely encourage our community to use them, take advantage of them. They're there for a reason. And, don't hesitate, you know, who knows, this could make you feel better. I mean, I encourage anyone that's, if something is off, call, like it's free, 1-800 number, you find it, it's at the palm of your hands, we all have our cell phones. So I definitely encourage our community to use the hotlines. And at the end of this, we will be providing some resources that people can take um, take with them and share, you know, share with your grandma, with your tias, with your tios, with, you know, your neighbors. Um, so they're there for a reason. Um, Luis, I want to ask you this next question. This came in from Brenda Durazo, who is a program coordinator for the First Five Steps Home Visiting Program, and she's an El Cajon resident. She writes that we know a lot of Latinx persons seeking uh, mental health support do not have health insurance. That's a big thing, health insurance. Um, are there any affordable uh, alternatives? There's resources in the community. For, for people and I think that's really important for us to bring to the community to you know especially us professionals or who, who do this work to really get informed of the resources that exist and bring them to the communities because I've been to so many communities uh, Spanish-speaking communities and I have off to find these resources and people look at me like is this a new resource you know no it's not a new resource you know it's just having reached this community but it's not new and then people are even more shocked to find out that they're, they're free. You know, so it is our responsibility responsibility of us people who work, who do this work to bring those, uh, these resources to the community. And I do know that um, for people under the age of 18, uh, people can get free mental health services, healthcare under the Affordable Care Act. Care Act. Uh, so definitely look, in, look into that, yes. Roy, how about you? Do you know, I mean, you know, because your service, um, I'm not 100% sure if, you know, how affordable it is because I know you're a chaplain. So I know it's spiritual. Like, how about you? What what do you have? Um, what do you know about uh, affordable alternatives? Yeah, so there's a couple of resources that uh, I, I want to uh, talk about as a corporate chaplain. So number one, um, if if you have your most workplaces, the, the benefits package is going to include uh, 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 therapeutic care. And so when I've talked to when I finish up my short-term uh, uh, counseling with employees, if I deem that they need continuous long-term care, then what we do is we um, we encourage them to reach out to their EAP program, their their insurance company, to say uh, I, I'm looking for therapy. And most insurance companies are going to say, "Yeah, absolutely. Here's a list of people that you can call in your area." Uh, what I also done is I have a list that I've compiled of local therapists so that as they're talking to me, there, here's a great opportunity to, to be a bridge from short-term to more long-term care. Um, 
So, uh, so a lot of companies do offer this through the benefits, and that's a very easy, low hanging resource that employees could take advantage of. Um, and so, and then there's local churches like North Coast Calvary Chapel and North Coast Church in Vista. They have free uh, counseling to community members. And so they could call North Coast Calvary Chapel, North Coast Church and say, I'm looking for counseling. Can I meet with somebody? Um, and some, some of the sessions are free. Some of them are very, very affordable. And so I'm really grateful to be a part of those networks so that people have options where they could visit. And people are taking advantage of them periodically. So that's really exciting. And I think, you know, getting familiar, familiarized with our health insurance, a lot of our Latinos are hardworking. They have health insurance. And they, I mean, they I, pay. Know, they pay for I know it. personally, I, you know, I can go at times without using my health insurance. And I'm like, I, I pay for dental. I pay for health insurance. Like we need to, we need to know what we're paying for and use it. We need to use our right. regular doctor visits. And I think a lot of our Latino community tends to not know what they're paying for, know what benefits they have and what it ultimately covers. So that's another Tanya, big thing. Yeah. Uh, on that note, I, I wanted to say that like as a pastor, as a, as a clergy person, um, we definitely believe that people need mental health just like they need medical health and spiritual health. There is, we don't have a, a bifurcation of what life looks like. We believe in our faith tradition that we are an integrated person. And so if we're feeling something on our chest, if we're having physical symptoms, some of that could be mental and emotional. And we believe from our faith perspective that it's very crucial to be seeing people like Luis and Lisette, that it's a whole package type of a thing where if I'm not able to address something as a clergy, and by the way, I think clergy need to also take responsibility and accept that we don't have all the answers and that we need people like Lisette, pe people like Luis in the community to say, you need to go and see them because this is out of my scope. I can teach you to pray. I can teach you to listen. I can teach you to meditate. I can point you to our faith tradition, but I'm not a therapist. And so I think having more bridging like that is going to be very crucial for people to understand. I mean, Latinos in general are very religious. And, and what I try to tell people is that our religion actually says that counseling is good. One of the terms that is referred to God is God is counselor. There are so many scriptures that are saying that there is guidance, there is hope, there is peace. It's very counseling oriented. So I think our faith tradition has a big value for the counseling tradition. And so we want to keep encouraging people to do that. I mean, we, we, you know, there's confession for a reason, right? It's probably para desahogarnos. Let's, let's get, right. you know, let's, let's talk to someone about our problems. So it's, you know, that's a, that's a sort of, that's a form of therapy. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, Talk therapy. I'd like to, I think we, we all can agree that we've seen an increase in domestic violence, sadly, with the pandemic. And Luis, I want to direct this question to you. This comes from a San Isidro resident who wrote in, wrote this into our website and said that in seeking domestic violence counseling, she's had a hard time getting calls back or it costs money. Are there any specific resources that you would recommend to this person that's seeking domestic violence counseling? Uh, yes, we do have a list of uh, resources around the county. Uh, so I would I would recommend to please call the, uh, the, the national hotline and they can connect you with where's with your, with your closest community center so you can get those services. Um, and something that I want to add <clears throat> that we're talking about mental health and services is that uh, also let's be aware that here in San Diego this is very new but uh, there's uh, we have. Uh, San Diego has provided a mobile crisis response team. Uh, so now for folks who are experiencing something, uh, you know, a, a crisis, a mental health illness, uh, there's a number uh, that is non-law enforcement. So I think that's really important for the community to be aware of. See, and I feel like, you know, slowly, these are baby steps. I mean, our our county, our, you know, we're, we're mobilizing, we're, like these little, you know, pop, mobile pop-ups, I mean, it's it's progress. There's still so much more that needs to be done, but, you know, it's baby steps. And um, 
Uh, we will be sharing uh, resources, you know, all, all these resources, you guys are going to be available at the end. And um, if you didn't register for the event, you can still register. Registration is open and that way we have your email and we can email all these resources out too. So you can all share with, you know, your community and use them yourself. Um, I just, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just thought somebody asked about hotlines if they charge. So if they go over them. So hotlines are you always free. And I think one thing that I want to make sure that we touch base on before we end this is that we do have a lot of undocumented immigrants in, in San Diego County. So we talked about insurance panels. We talked about, you know, clinics and programs. One thing that I want everyone to know, whether you're documented or not, you still have access to health care. We cannot deny services. I mean, myself as a clinician, we cannot deny services for that. Um, even if you're documented or not and you need mental health services, there's a lot of programs that are free and they don't require you to have documentation. They will ask for your birthday, your name. You don't have to give them your, your social security number. Even you can call a hotline. I think this is why I like hotlines because within our community, we don't like telling people our business. But a hotline is someone on the phone you can't see. They can't see you. You tell them what's going on and they will guide you to where you need to go. They'll give you a list of people that you can call. If you need to get out of there fast, they will get you out of there fast. And it's free and they will not ask any questions. They don't know you. It's safe. And I think that for our community, I think it's important that people know that pick up the phone. Now you can text. You can even text even. There's different codes that it looks like. It's just like a coupon that they're sending you and they send you an address. So please use those hotlines because they don't know you. And I know sometimes a lot of our community are, are don't want to talk about it. And they'll give you those free resources, especially if you are don't have insurance or you're undocumented. But you have access to it. You make a great point, Liz. I, you know, there are, we have a, you know, a large undocumented population here in San Diego. And so that's huge. It's a phone number. They don't know you. They're not going to see you. Um, you know, feel free to tell them what you're feeling, what's going on, because they, you know, they could potentially save someone's life and just, you know, guide you in the right direction. So thank you for bringing that point up. Um, this next question is, you know, it, it's, it's a hard topic, you guys, and I want to give our audience a warning. Um, this next question can be triggering or disturbing to some of our uh, viewers tuning in. So um, a San Diego resident wrote into our website and said, my daughter was molested when she was nine years old, and I want her to start talking about it. We have Kaiser insurance, but it doesn't cover family therapy or some kind of therapy that could help my daughter. Um, you know, I don't know. I, some of you guys are parents. Like, Do you guys have any suggestions for this parent? Um, I think I, I mean, we probably all seen this time and time again. Um, and I think it's hard for the parent. Obviously it's very hard for the child. I think sometimes a parent has a really tough time because we feel like we're the protectors. And then when something like this happens, it affects our mental health, right? As a parent, um, we see that a lot at the shelter. So we kind of have to treat the child and then we make sure that we meet the needs of, of the mom. One thing with trauma we have to be careful when we're treating it. I think clinicians out there are, are gonna agree with me. If you try to treat trauma too early, it's not gonna work because they're gonna shut down. It might make things worse. So we have to wait actually for the client for it to be ready. I see, I specialize in trauma work, uh, sexual trauma actually, um, and severe mental health and when I, I cannot tell you how many times I'll see, I'll see a young adult or a 20, 30 year old saying, you know, I got molested when I was very young, CWS was involved, I went to therapy, I didn't want to talk about it, I just gave him little bits and pieces, it didn't work, it just prolonged kind of like the treatment and now that they're adults or you know, young adolescents, now they're ready to talk about it. So I think with trauma, we really have to be careful on how we navigate that because sometimes we can be doing more harm than helping. So we want to make sure that we address it as soon as possible, but we do want to respect, sometimes people don't want to talk about it because they're afraid. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we, we can address it too early if the trauma is just like right there. So we have to make sure that first of all the client's ready and that you're having the, the appropriate provider um it's funny that you said kaiser because i get a lot of referrals from kaiser in the private practice because they don't do family therapy and i do family therapy for trauma um and right now there's three four months wait time 
to get any type of appointment. So I would say if trauma occurs, you know, try to do some access and crisis line kind of work to make sure that the, the youth is not suicidal, that they're not thinking of self-harming, because that could be really, sometimes a lot of people that have been raped um, do a lot of self-harm and suicide, so you want to make sure that you're addressing that. And then making sure that you try to get an appointment, you know, especially right now since it's so far out, to make sure that we're addressing not only just the child, but the parents too. I think a lot of people forget that the, the caregiver goes through a lot of that trauma too. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as a parent, I can see what, how that can be traumatic on the parent as well. And, you know, it's um, it's really sad, but I think it's, you know, I think you make a great point about having, you know, the person be ready to talk about it and not forcing it. We want to, we want to, you know, increase mental health awareness, but don't force it if someone's not ready. Um, I want to turn it to one of our community members to ask this next question. So take a look. Hi, this is Mariana from Chula Vista. With the pandemic, we saw a lot of people reconnecting to the outdoors. Can you talk a little bit about the health, um, physical and mental health benefits that we get from being out in nature? Who wants to take this one? I'll 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 take a stab I'll take a stab at it. Um, so in our in our wisdom tradition, we we personally see. Um, a, a lot of uh, figures in the Bible that are doing things outside. And during the pandemic, one of the things that we did as a family is that we did a lot of more walks together as a family. And uh, I, I ride uh, road bikes. So I'm one of those dudes that's, uh, I'm a Latino that's uh, wearing spandex out uh, riding 50, 80, 90 miles out in San Diego. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, if I've had a really tough week, being out in nature, having the sun hitting me, uh, exerting my body is releasing the bad stress. And then it's creating the good endorphins, the good chemicals. And so uh, I tell people that I feel like I get baptized every time I go out uh, in nature um, uh, to, to reconnect with the ground. Uh, one of my favorite theologians said that it's hard to love yourself and it's hard to love people. So start with loving rocks, start with loving the sky, start with loving the trees. And that if we get a love for creation, that we might actually get a love for self uh, and for others. Yeah, and I mean, go ahead. To piggyback off Roy, uh, when, when you're treating someone that's depressed, we usually will recommend, the psychiatrist will recommend vitamin D. Um, and people that are depressed usually don't go outside because they're indoors, so they're lacking the vitamin D. So the simple fact that we're outside and we're getting that vitamin D is actually making us feel better. Dopamine levels go up, you know, all those good chemicals that make you feel better, just the breathing air. And then one thing about the outdoors is that it helps us get grounded. So one technique that we use in therapy, just when we're in therapy, it's a grounding technique to help us get grounded. So being out the outdoors, it naturally grounds you because you're getting all those sensories. You're getting the smell, the water, the trees, the air hitting air, the birds. There's all those sensory that help you get grounded. So you're not so much focused on what's actually going in here that you're stressed out about and that anxiety. So the outdoors, I'm an outdoor person. I'm a hiker. <laughs> so I love hiking. So whenever I have a stressful time, I, I go hit the bounce and go hiking and just try to relax or, you know, go towards the beach. But grounding, 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 and just helps you kind of like stay in the moment and vitamin D. Yeah, you know, I mean, sometimes um, we're hesitant. I'm like, oh, should I go on a hike? Should I go on a walk? But once you're done with it, you feel so much better. You come back and you're like, I am so happy I did that. And you just feel refreshed and alive and you're ready to get your day going. So I definitely, definitely agree. Um, I want to I wanna show this next question. Um, Liz, you can, you know, feel free to answer this one. Hi, Tanya. This is Beatriz or B. Palmer. Thank you for allowing me to ask a question. And my question today is, how are the mental health professionals preparing to address some of the um, very real barriers that our Latino community is experiencing? Um, how can we you know, reach out to mental health professionals when, when some of them don't understand the pulse of our communities and the traumas that come with that? There are language barriers. There are um, fears of immigration and historical trauma that we've encountered. How are the mental health professionals and the field of mental health preparing? I know that we're promoting 
you know, that more of our Latino community reach out and access these services. But, you know, are they ready, you know, to help our community um, walk through this new way of addressing our trauma? Thank you. So great question from B. B is actually the vice president of our organization, so I love to see her there. Um, so I'll take a little jab at it first. I think just in general, mental health professionals, I think, like I said, nobody prepared us for this pandemic. But I think one thing that I think I just saw was our, the clinical, like clinicians and professionals coming in together and just asking for help of like, what is our niches of like, hey, you're an expert in this, help us in this. Um, you're the expert on that, help, like helping each other. So the community in itself, I think, has gone stronger and more united. One thing that I, I want to emphasize is that, yes, we have cultural competency. We all have to take cultural competency and take those units to make sure that we know every culture out there. Um, but I think one important thing that, like I mentioned on the report before, is that if you're within the culture, you understand the, the components and the aspects of of what the culture and the structures are, are, are right? If you know that you are afraid to go outside or you know apply for a job or go to the doctor because you're undocumented, you cannot go see the doctor or the therapist even if they have a sliding scale because it's twenty five dollars that you don't have, right? So the way that at least at work I'm preparing here at the practice um, or just even at the shelter, making sure that we have resources for the families available, whether they have documentation or not, or here at the shelter, at the practice, I'm sorry, I have created a sliding scale for people that, you know, don't have access to mental health that need or that are on the wait list for four months. I have so many people calling me, can I please just go see you in those private pay until the insurance could get me in. So how do I expedite that process? A lot of the times people don't have access to severe mental health. Like I used to work for this program, Kickstart, and it was first it was only for Medi-Cal. I mean, first it was just for people that didn't have insurance and then Medi-Cal. And how do we create access for those people that don't know where to search? So it's really just education. I think a lot of Facebook groups have been doing such a wonderful job or Instagram of just sharing some of those resources. So I think as a community, as a whole, we should take kind of like a pledge of like sharing those resources for those people that need it, not just, okay, well, it's out there, people know about it. This is really, I think just as a provider, it's our, our responsibility to make sure that we share those resources and we make it available for everyone, but then we also know what we're dealing with. And I think one thing that maybe as providers, like I know, okay, this is out of my scope, kind of like what Roy said, and where can I send this client that I know that they're going to be taken care of? Like, so not just sending them back to Kaiser, that I know that there's no Hispanic provider there, or not just sending them to the community center because they have resources there, like maybe linking them because it takes some, sometimes within the, our community, it might take us a little bit longer to find the right fit and finding the right fit for therapy. It's the key. It's, it's a key. You can have the best therapist in the world, the most educated one, but if it's not the right fit for you, treatment's not gonna work or it's not gonna be as effective. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisette. Uh, you're the expert on, on therapy. I appreciate that. Um, and so what I, you know, what I encourage, I just wanna encourage people to reach out for help, you know, really pick up the phone and, and call. You know, you're not alone for people who are experiencing domestic violence. You're not alone. Uh, we are here to help you and, and, you know, get you into a better position. You know, and I, and I appreciate each and one of you because when I met you, I mean, you, you, you identify as Latino. And so, um, you know, just through, through my own reporting, I can I can see, you know, why our community has such a hard time connecting and finding those resources. And that's why we're having this conversation. And um, I feel like we could go on and on and on and talk about this. And we want to thank everyone that tuned in for joining us. And I, you know, I think just by participating and listening in tonight, we are already making progress. It's baby steps, but progress is being made. And, you know, it's great to talk about it, but I feel like the resources are really what needs to be shared. And so before we end this conversation, we want to share and provide some of the resources that um, we have found. So um, one of them is the San Diego Mental Health Access and Crisis Line that has counselors available seven days a week, 24 hours a day to provide support, 
uh, referrals and crisis intervention. The National Domestic Violence Hotline will refer people to their closest domestic violence resource center. Family Health Centers of San Diego provides health care and support services for people who are uninsured or low income. And they have clinics in San Diego and East and South San Diego County. So all over, um, you know, they'll, they'll find you a place near your own home. La Maestra Clinics offers mental health counseling. They are in San Diego and National City. The National Alliance on Mental Illness San Diego provides mental health education and support. And, um, you know, please, if you um, if you would like a copy of these resources and you didn't register, um, we and we invite you to register so that you can get a copy of all these resources so that you could share because it starts with us. This conversation that we're having, it starts with us and it starts with talking about it um, and sharing it and having, you know, those awkward conversations, having them over the tamales and you know the champurrado and the atoles and just talking about it checking in with our family members are you okay if you notice that something is off about someone that you care about and you love um i think it's important that we you know we gently ask and just check in you know with 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 people that you care about um because ultimately one of these resources are just you know you asking that question about are they okay can ultimately save someone's life make a difference and maybe get somebody to um to to seek therapy and just get that help that they may need and you know thank you uh, to all of our panelists for taking the time today to talk about this very very important topic and please you know um i want to continue reporting on important topics so anytime feel free to message me um, any news tips, anything that you want to be, you want to get covered in your community and to stay in touch with KPBS, please sign up on our newsletter so that you can get everything that we're covering. Um, you can go to kpbs.org slash newsletters, but thank you to all of our panelists that took the time today and for your continued work because you are making a difference um, in people's lives and I want to thank all of you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone.